This is Push Button Influence, where the world's leading influencers candidly share their exact strategies for maximizing reach, accelerating growth, and generating massive exposure, all by leveraging the power of new media. You can become the next Larry King, Oprah, or Howard Stern. All you need to do is broadcast your brilliance. Push Button Influence teaches you how. Here are your hosts, Alex Mondosian and Steve Olsher. All right, all right, all right. Welcome to another edition here of Push Button Influence. Really, really, really glad to have you with us. I am Steve Olsher along with Alex Mondosian and our super awesome, very cool online veteran extraordinaire, Mr. Perry Marshall, joining us. And by the way, Wait, Alex, I learned something, which is when we point, if I point at you like this on the video, I'm actually pointing the wrong way. <laughs> so, so, so I have to point, I think I have to point like this if I'm pointing at, Mar- uh, at Perry and then like this if I'm pointing at you. So we, uh, we learn something new every single day to just cover all, all bases, right? All right, Perry, really, really cool to have you here. And I know that you are a super busy dude. So it's appreciated that you took the time out to join That's us great. here on Push Button Influence and share your wisdom. Now, Alex, as we do every week here on the show, we start out with a word and I will defer to you to share that what your word is first. Well, Perry has changed his focus over the years. I've known him since I think 2002, but I think what he embodies for me most is not wasting time and to do little things that make a big difference and so the word for me today is leverage, leverage. Now, L-E-V, L-E-V-E-R, lever, right? Like the Archimedes lever. And you can actually move the world with the right levels, lever. So you've uh, partnered with someone who knows all about the 80-20 rule. He's worth over $200 million. You know how to do little things that make a big impact. What does leverage mean to you, your business, and to your family? Because you've leveraged yourself. I stopped at man on man with two kids. Uh, you have a lot more than that. You play zone defense. So what's that all about? We do. Um, well, the family, you know, we, we have like four regular kids and two adopted ones. Um, and uh, they're, they're both from China. So one of them came here a year ago and the other one four years. And, um, you know, one of the little secrets that most people don't know is that after you get above four kids, it doesn't really make all that much difference. <laughs> um, most people are unaware of that. Now the minivans keep getting more expensive and the hotel rooms keep getting more expensive and and the restaurants keep getting more expensive, but the actual management of the kids part levels off. Uh, that's a very important, useful thing to know. Um, in fact, I even have a couple friends that actually they adopted because we adopted. So I think it's viral. It's a great thing to do. You kind of, got to just, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of like fasting or something. Like once you actually made up your mind, like I'm not going to eat the rest of today, it's not that big of a deal. It's just when you're like, not really sure, you know, that's, that's the hard part. Um, Leverage, you know, the biggest thing I would say about leverage is, um, you know, somebody put it to me this way. He's, and this is a long time ago. He goes, He goes, a good software programmer isn't like three times better than a bad one. He's a thousand times better than a bad one. And that's true of almost anything. The the good things that you should be doing aren't like, now they're not always a thousand, okay? Sometimes they're only 10 times better. But, you know, very often they're a hundred times better. The whole world is actually exponential. You know, you know this if you have a garden, you know, if you let the weeds go in your garden, it like might only take six weeks, it's completely engulfed in weeds and it's because of multiplication. And, you know, I I think um, the way most people receive their education, they're very unaware of this. Most people think inequality is, well, they got a 97 on the test and I got a 77 or vice versa. And they think that the person who got the 97 is like 20% better. And, and if they're really better, they might actually be 20 times better, not 20% better. 
um, especially when it comes to actually accomplishing something and not just sitting down and taking a test. And um, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe some people would need to be like a numbers person to really get what I'm saying. But I tell you, I got it. I got it in a big way. I remember when it happened. It happened when I was reading Richard Koch's book, The 20 Principle. And all of a sudden, oh, my world. Like, I live in an exponential world. Like, you know, the Kennedy Expressway in Chicago r literally does get 10,000 times as much traffic as the street I live on. Right. So the world is so unequal, hugely, hugely unequal. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great, great points there. All right. My word for you, sir, is evolve. <laughs> and what I would love for you to talk about <laughs> is how you have evolved on a personal level over the years and also, of course, on a professional level. And if you can speak specifically to how you see the internet evolving, how did it inter you know, really evolve over the past few years to what it is today? And if possible, can you talk about where you see this evolving to insofar as the online space is concerned? Okay. Absolutely. Um, so can I talk about the personal first? Um, so, you know, one, one of my abiding beliefs is that, is that I, I do not have the right to ignore any verifiable fact. If it's in front of me, um, I need to acknowledge it. And now the context is, is humans have an amazing capacity for denial. I'm sure it's probably a good thing because it helps us cope with stuff or whatever. But really, I think especially for an entrepreneur, you really have to decide, I am not going to give my luck, myself the luxury of being in denial. And I, th I think it starts, it starts with your personal life. Like, you know, if you've got an anger issue or if you've got some emotional problem or you've got some habit or some addiction or anything like that, I... I I just bedrock baseline truth is like, you, you must d deal with it. Okay. Um, and you know, we all go through phases in life and you know, most people have some kind of midlife crisis. And I, you know, I would just say that, you know, I got to a spot a few years ago where it's like, well, are you going to medicate mm. yourself? Are you going to really deal with your crap? You know, and, we can go deeper on that if you guys really want to, but yeah, I at least not necessary wanted to, to go too that deep on much. that. We really appreciate you sharing Profesh it, but obviously you've evolved yeah. personally. I yeah, think whatever. is where that's yeah. going, which I think we all do. Um, but yeah, awesome sharing yeah. that. Let, let's shift to. We don't want you to cry. This isn't like I'm, we're not Barbara Walters here. We don't want you if you do, if you choose to cry, you can cry. But that we're not forcing you to cry here, man. So <laughs> we can shift over to the professional side which is the evolution of the internet. And I think you got that question pretty clear when I asked it the first time. Yeah. So, so, you know, prof professionally, you know, I think there's this fine line a person's got to walk and it's being relevant to your market, your audience, whatever, whether you wake up in the morning, excite all excited about them or not. Okay. Like, I think I think most careers, most markets, most customers, they're like spouses. Sometimes you wake up and you're really excited to be next to them, and other times it's like, who is this, right? But you know, you, you know, hey, you're 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 in the game, and 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 you need to wake up every morning, and you need to do your best. But there really is a fine line between, um, you know, making sure that you're being useful to somebody, but at the same time finding a way to be true to yourself and um and and to figure out where am i going next you know i i i i, I just had coffee with a longtime friend of mine from childhood and she's her name is tosca lee she's a fairly famous fiction author uh, makes a real good living writing fiction which not too many people doing that you know and, and she was talking about like well, you get in a market and your audience wants a certain thing, but then like, well, what do you want to write? And, you know, the truth is, is you can't just capitulate to one or the other. 
if all you do is just cater to the audience, you'll get stale. And if all you do is do what you want, you'll become irrelevant. And there's, there's really, you've kind of got to skate between those two things. And I, I really believe you, you've got to make some time to go smell the roses. I think you need to have some, you must, must, must create a space in your life where like I'm pretty religious about taking one day off of a week. I think people that work seven days yeah. a week are making a big mistake. Uh, internet. Let's talk about internet for, for a second. You know, uh, evolution in, in, in the popular culture is this kind of sterile, academic, kind of purposeless word. It kind of has this biology overtone. And I think that word is even misrepresented in biology. Make no mistake, evolution is a very, very intentional thing but you never know how it's going to turn out because there's always something that's going to be a surprise. Now, um, I wrote a book called Evolution 2.0, Breaking the Deadlock Between Darwin and Design. It literally is a science book. Now, there are in, in my book, I explain that there are five tools of the evolutionary process. Two, three of the three of the five are gradually incremental, Kaizen continuous improvement, incremental changes. Okay, and two of them are major quantum leap, like new species in one generation type changes. Okay, both of the ones where you get quantum leap involve merging two different things together and making them work. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, it's, this is the most successful merger acquisition in all of history, and every merger acquisition can be modeled after this, okay? So like direct from the science lab to the entrepreneur world, like import new piece of knowledge, okay? Every green blade of grass you've ever seen in your life, every green leaf or tree or shrub or anything like that, the reason it's green is because, okay, in high school, they told you it's got a chloroplast, which converts sunlight into energy, and it's green. Well, you know what a chloroplast actually is? It's a blue-green algae. It literally is a blue-green algae, and it's living inside a plant cell. It's got its own DNA. It's got its own reproductive cycle. It's a, it's a cell inside a cell. Okay? Now, it's a great partnership. Why? Because a plant cell is a really nice, cozy, safe place for an algae to live. It doesn't have to sit in the middle of a pond and try to defend itself or get eaten by a frog. Okay, it's really great. And it's really great, if you're a plant cell, it's really great to have algae because it catches sunlight and it turns it into energy and it like dumps buckets of energy into your cells so that you could do stuff. Okay, now every major evolutionary leap is some resemblance you're taking a completely new intact thing from the outside. And that's the important, from the outside and you're bringing it in, okay? Now, if you were to look at all the major innovations that have happened in the history of internet marketing, you could look at email, you could look at the invention of the web browser, you could look at the invention of the search engine, you could look at autoresponders, you could look at Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all of those things, what all of these things did was they took something that already existed and they brought it into a new context and said, hey, look what you can do if you jam these two things together, okay? And, and the new thing always comes from the outside. New systems never reinvent themselves, almost never. Like, you will almost never see a, an innovation come on the inside of the industry. It's always an outsider shows up. So the Uber guy, was he from the taxi industry? He was not, no. No, no. 
Like there's a hundred thousand cab drivers that could have started Uber. None of them did. Which is to say, you better find a way to be going outside your industry and good grief, like I hope you're interested in something besides just your business. Could you please have a hobby? Could you please have some friends? Yeah. Right? So, so the future of the internet um, <laughs> is, <laughs> what, what, how about this? What do you like about the internet now? Like, what are you, what are you digging on it? If like you, you take one of your private clients and you go and you say, hey, this is a strategy that we need to implement right now. What's like one of the top strategies? And then Alex, will, I know he's got a ton of questions as well. But like I said, what's the one strategy that you move all of your online clients, the, those who want to, you know, obviously do really, really well online. What's that one core strategy right now that you're in favor of? Um, well, so the, the, the hot one right off the top of my head is the concept of autoresponders has to move out to more concentric circles from where it's been. Okay, so if you're good at autoresponders, what you're doing is they're getting on your email list and then the content is, is self-adjusting based on what they click on and what they're interested in. And if they go click on these things, you get more of this, and they go click on these things, they get more of that. And it's smart, and that's great. So that gets you up to like 2010, okay? Um, that same idea needs to also extend to people who are in your gravitational pull but not on your email list. And this is because of mobile and social media, right? I, I don't see email going away, but it's, it's like very gradually declining in its overall impact, okay? And social media is going up, and with mobile especially, right? So social media, like all that same kind of content needs to be showing up and usually you need to spend money to make that happen. And right now, most people in the world aren't willing to spend that money, and frankly, they should be. It's exactly like search engines in 2006. In 2006, 10 years ago, most people just, they were sure that search is supposed to be free. And the smart people like, I'm paying for this, dude. Like, skip to the front of the line, pay your money, and I'm gonna like put my Google ad right up front, right? Well, I think you need to be doing that with, with everybody like that you can cookie and retarget on your site. Well, but then you need to take it another step, which is you also need to be doing micro brand advertising to the people that are in your general space that haven't even come to your website yet. And so you have to market before you market, then you have to market while you're marketing, and then you have to market after like the first kiss. Um, and I, I think people that are not doing that are like rowing their little boats towards extinction. All right, a couple of things Perry said. Um, in his hometown of Chicago, or he lives, lives nearby, uh, a guy by the name of Henry Ford was visiting a meatpacking plant and there were 2,100 uh, car manufacturers. One of them happened to be in Detroit, his, and everyone brought the stuff to the car that was on a block. And what he observed in the meatpacking plant was the meat going past the butchers, you know, the cows. And if, if you're a vegetarian, I apologize in advance. I'll probably get some hate mail for this. And he found out it, each butcher was taking little bits and pieces off and packing the meat. That's why they call it meatpacking. That hadn't that hadn't been new to meatpacking. That had been there for almost 100 years, but it was new to car manufacturing. He went back with that idea. It was mm. lateral thinking, and he got it from outside of his industry, and he became Henry Ford, built a middle class, and all the cities were built out instead of being built up. Now, that's a great example. The next, the next word, Perry, mm. is growth, because what people don't know about you, which I do, we spoke just recently, is you believe that it's a lot easier to go from million to billion, then oftentimes it is going from zero to a million. And you're focusing on million dollar companies that can become billion dollar companies. And even if you haven't made your first million folks, listen to what this thinking is all about because this thinking is outside of your box 
of thinking. Because I don't think you think about billions as much, you know, adding that extra few zeros. So Perry, in growth, what does it mean to have a billion dollar company? Zuckerberg knows it, uh, Warren Buffett knows it, Oprah knows it, J.K. Rowling knows it, Steve Jobs knew it, of course, uh, Bill Gates knows it, um, Shaquille O'Neal now knows it, and Magic Johnson knows it. This billionaire concept is not just being this uh, dot-com baby, it's a way of thinking and having certain types of products. So. I got a sneak peek into your brain. Why don't you drain it a little bit? I had a, a seminar in London in 2010, and this couple came. They rode the train down from Scotland, and they they bought one of the hot seats, and we went through the hot seat, and I did this whole thing called Swiss Army Knife with them. Uh, and... Um, the guy was selling fantasy football and he had to explain to me what fantasy football was because I didn't know. And I'm like, I mean, I don't know. I'm about as much of a basketball guy as a calculator can make you. Um, and, uh, you know, so I didn't know. Um, and but he's explaining fantasy football. I'm like, OK. So once he did that, I explained to him, oh. So here's why people buy from you and here's what's going on inside their heads and all that. It was all great. Right. And, you know, and then everybody went home like a year ago, I get a message from one of the, one of my friends. And he's like, Hey, you know, remember when we were at that London seminar? Hey, look at these guys. They just raised a uh, $70 million of funding. You know what the company was? It was FanDuel, the fantasy football guys. And they're worth a billion dollars now. I'm like, holy cow, that's that's great, you know. And then, you know, Alex and I were were talking about, um, about like Infusionsoft being in diapers when we started working with them. I mean, uh, the first time I talked to Clayton Mask, Infusionsoft wasn't even like a fertilized ovum yet, and he was like, we'll work, we'll write software for food, right? And, you know, now they're like a hundred million dollar company or something. So, so, you know, I've had these little acorns turn into large oaks in my backyard. Now there's something really interesting that I think is the most common thread of these zero to a billion success stories. And it's, I learned this from Richard Koch and it's they they are all one of two kinds of simplifiers so what FanDuel actually did was they took something that already had existed for like 30 years that's how long fantasy of football had been around since the probably 60s but it was this very cumbersome thing and you had to gather all of the stats and you had to find the people and everything and what FanDuel actually did was they made it really easy to do fantasy football with absolute minimum effort in one place. And nobody had really done that. What they did was they dramatically simplified it. They made it literally 10 times as simple as it had been before. Now, what do I mean by simple? Well, it's all relative, but if you cut the number of steps to do something by 80%, you have simplified it. Now, what most people do is they, they take 100 steps and they shave five steps off and, they, and you're down to 95 and they go, I got a USP, yay. And then they shave a few more. Oh, now we're down to 90, yay. And they're like in this incremental, almost like shaving pennies race with everybody else. Oh, you know, get a little simpler, a little easier. No, if, if, you, sh if you take something that people really need to do and you shave it from 100 steps down to 20, which is what FanDuel did, you have a, actually a very good chance of creating a hundred million or a billion dollar company and and 
you do not have to be a management genius, a corporate culture guru, or like something like that for it to happen. The market will pull it from you. Now, there's another kind of simplification, and Alex alluded to it, and it's price simplification. Now, what Henry Ford did was in the space of about six years, he drove the price of an automobile down. He didn't get it down 80%, but he actually got it down by about 60%. He got the price of an automobile down from $1,600 to $360. Now, guess what happened? The demand didn't go up like 4X. It went 700X. Now, getting the price of the automobile from $1,500 down to $360 was a bitch. Make no mistake. Building Infusionsoft, Alex, would you agree that building Infusionsoft and holding all those customers' hands was a uh, It bitch? was a huge bitch, and that's what prevented them from growing. Yeah, but, right. but let's take, let's take but, for example, Dropbox. Look how fast they grew because it hmm. was super, super simple. Let's take Southwest Airlines yes. versus United, which has a hub, of course, in, in, uh, 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 in Chicago. I mean, one is super simple, one kind of plane, you know, fewer unions and one mechanic, one one type of seating, socialism, right? At, you know, first come, first serve. And then the other airline is super complicated. Yep. So that that's both simplification of right. process and price. Yes. And so like if 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 you really take the simplification process by the horns, you you could turn a million dollar company into a $50 million company or a hundred million dollar company and you don't have to be a superstar. You know, I've, I've got a round table member, Max Gudin and in Europe, he's in the Netherlands and they sell cards that you buy that allow you to play video games. So like instead of, instead of um, being a member of somebody's video playing network, um, you can just buy a $20 credit code and then enter it. And so you could be anonymous if you want to. Um, this has turned into a huge business and it started with the guys going, well, I don't have a credit card and I don't want to use a credit card and I don't want to log in on their system. So there's got to be some way to do this. It's essentially kind of like a gift card, but most people don't use them as gift cards. They use them as like, Hey, I want to play some games. I'm going to buy $20 of games. Um, and now he's got the whole gaming industry eating out of his hand because he controls the currency that people use to play video games. And so now the video manufacturers are lined up. Dramatic simplification. And it's, it, it's a company that almost anybody who's listening in today would be envious yeah. to have. Awesome. All right. So, guys, if you're just joining us here live on Blab, welcome. We are talking to Perry Marshall. And uh, if you're just joining us here in the podcast, then why did you fast forward? Because you must have missed a lot. So go back and listen to what you missed because you shouldn't be here now if you're listening to the podcast. All right. So let me ask you this, Perry. Uh, first and foremost, what is the project right now? that's got you most excited in the online space specifically? Um, right now, it's my Simplify project with Richard Koch. And if you want to see what we're doing, go to simplify.fm. Um, but it's, it's, it's realizing that this model of simplification, whether you go the, you know, the sophistication route or the reduce the price route, um, that both are radical evolutions. They're not just these incremental things. Um, and as I've absorbed this thinking process, you know, we, we continue to, to do our business and create courses and, and do different programs and things. And I'm just realizing kind of the low expectations that, our traditional assumptions have kind of been saddled with. Um, and, you know, really asking myself the question, like, well, are we really simplifying the customer experience or 
are we doing what an awful lot of knowledge uh, worker, knowledge vendors, information uh, product kind of people do, which is pile on like, and you get this, and you get this, and you get this, and the kind of the Ginsu knife thing, the, you know, the and you get this and this and this, it can and it does work, but it doesn't make anything simple. And most businesses that sell that way don't get very big. Now, don't get me wrong, that's not 100% true. There's always exceptions, but I'm just really realizing that, you know, there has never been a time when there was more companies going from zero to a billion faster. And I realized like talking about a billion dollars is way over most people's heads and you're like, oh my goodness, like what, what does this have to do with me? Well, if look, if, if you want to go from zero to a million or zero to a hundred thousand dollars, almost certainly, if you're going to do it without tons of pain and suffering, you're going to do it by making somebody's life a whole lot simpler. That's just the way it is. So whether you can simplify and the biggest thought you can think right now is $10,000 or if you can go all the way to 10 billion, simplification is the fastest yeah, way to get there. I'll, uh, I'll edify and support that because when you ask a billionaire and I've asked five billionaires in, in my interviews, Richard Branson, now it's Sir Richard Branson. I asked them this question, what's the difference between a billionaire and a millionaire? And he said, a billionaire is a millionaire who thinks more simply, right? He's a more simple thinker. He has more simple metrics. The, the CEO of Remax only looked at one thing. How many new Remax offices were being opened this month? And that could determine as a critical driver, not as a KPI, key performance indicator, that's looking in the rears. That is looking into the future. How healthy is this company? So, Barry, I'm going to talk about this because mm -hmm. 80 20 suggests this, it insu insinuates this. 20% of the things that you're doing should produce 80% of the volume. 20% of your clothes you're wearing 80% of the time. That means 80% of your clothes you're wearing 20% of the time. 20% of your people are producing 80% of the profits. With affiliate marketing, Steve and I are about to have a launch. 5% of our JV partners will produce 100% of the sales. So, this question of where to focus, mm -hmm. that really is what the 80-20 principle is all about. Focus on the few to generate more versus focusing on the more that generate. Okay, people have a chronic tendency and like I am the greatest of offenders, by the way. Okay, look, you know, preaching to the, my own choir here. Um, of just like thinking more is more, okay? Like in the human lizard brain, more equals more. Like that's, that's what Homer Simpson thinks every day when he gets out of bed. Well, less is more. And I think, so here's, here's what I find myself doing. I find myself asking questions like, all right, I got this thing. I got this product. I got this system. I got this process. I got this customer. New rule. For every one thing I add, I have to take two things away. For every one thing I add to my to-do list, I have to take two things away. Well, that's actually a really awesome criteria because, first of all, it pushes back on adding the one thing, right? Oh, hang right on, there. time out. So in real terms, to make it concrete, what Perry is saying, and Jim Collins has said this over the years, he wrote Good to Great, um, for every one thing you add on your to-do list, add two things to your don't-do list. And, and that will mm -hmm. simplify. Yes, okay, so, like, if you make it so, you know, you 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 got you got your to-do list for you know for this afternoon, right? And of course, you know the phone's gonna ring, you know an email's gonna come along, right? Now, if you have a rule like, all right, I already made this list, I already thought about it. This is a good list. I don't get to add anything to this unless I knock two other things off, right? Well, that that creates instant resistance to whatever the phone call was about, whatever you were gonna say yes to, right? 
And it means that if it does make it in, your life just got simpler. So it's like totally win-win, right? Now, what if, what if you also do that to, um, like how many men use deep the little doohickey is in your software that you're writing? Or what if it's, um, if I'm going to add another product to my product line, I have to discontinue two other products. You know, we, we, we slashed and burned like four or five or six products that we had sold for years about a year ago. And it really hurt, like, because I have this personal attachment to it and I put so much of myself into it and all this other stuff. I'm like, yeah, I know. But look, this is not like state of the art, latest, greatest. Like, it's not wowing people anymore. Like, if it's not really great, yeah, I know it's making $5,000 a month. But it was almost like this wow, karmic belief or something that like the fact that it's there, it's occupying space, it's, I don't know, I mean, sorry if it sounds metaphysical, but I just, I just believe like when you get rid of stuff, it makes room for something better. Like when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And pruning a tree, you give it more life, right? Right, it's, it's right. Like, like, oh, what, we're going to make the tree bigger by cutting stuff off of it, right? It's it's really counterintuitive. Not, yeah. Yep. Very much so. Uh, all right. So we're, believe it or not, we're just cruising through here. So thanks for sharing all this knowledge here, Perry. If, if you guys have questions, that's the benefit of joining us live every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. This is your opportunity to get your question in the queue, and Perry will be answering those in just a wee little bit here. So use forward slash capital Q at the beginning of your sentence there in the chat roll, and then ask your question and we will get you into the queue. All right, so Perry, question for you. Um, you know, obviously if you look at the the growth from zero to a billion, right? And the number of unicorns that have been coming, you know, uh, geez, it's like, I don't know, it's over a hundred now uh, in just the past few years. It's, it's a ridiculous number, but isn't that a byproduct of the growth of connectivity? Because we couldn't do that before in terms of being able to reach out in the ways that we do now. You have all the citizen reporters. You have all the social media. You have everything that is basically coming to this perfect storm of basically being able to be in front of as many people as possible at any one given time, which never existed before. So do you think the zero to a billion is a byproduct of the connectivity? Yes, and here's what it's another pro byproduct of. It's a byproduct of the number of cycles of, like, call and response, right? It's, it's, it's the speed at which conversations can happen. It's the speed at which a product can be put out there and then, and then um, uh, get sold or get rejected, right? And, and so, so the internet has created this speed. Now the speed has created something else. It has turned 80, 20 into 90, 10. So I got my book, 80, 20 sales and marketing and the Pareto principle, 80% of the people make 20% of the money and 20% of people make 80% of the money. But on the internet, almost everything is actually 10% of the people make 90% of the money. 10% of the products get 90% of the distribution. 10% of the emails get 90% of the clicks because everything's in dog years. The only difference between 60, 40 and 99, one is time, right? If we're looking at all the companies that started yesterday and how many of them are still around today, it's 60, 40. But if we expand it to 100 years, it's 99.1. So what the internet does is it speeds things up. Now, you actually do business totally different in a 90.10 world than you do in an 80.20 world. In a 90.10 world, there's only one winner, right? We've got, there's like six major auto manufacturers. There's one Google, there's one Facebook, there's one Amazon, there's one eBay, there's one Blab, there's one Uber, yeah, like Lyft. So I had a conversation today with a billionaire, by the way, and he's telling me about one of his companies. 
Well, it's a totally different market, has nothing to do with cars, but let's say for the sake of discussion, he was Lyft. I said, you're gonna have to niche this into a market that Uber's not in or shut it down. And like, I did not want to tell him that. I like this guy, I like him as a friend. I don't even quite think him of him as a client and I wasn't charging for the phone call, like we're just getting to know each other. But I said, dude, like, I'm really sorry, you know, and I'm not pronouncing doom and gloom, but based on this one hour conversation, like you're gonna have to seriously pivot this thing or it's never gonna, it, the other guy is already so far ahead of you, like 90, 10, there's only gonna be one. And he's like, yeah, we, we've, you know, we've been wrestling with that already and you're telling what you're telling me i think i already knew and yeah. and and so it's like fail fast like gary halbert's old advice like times 10 man like fail really fast yeah alex well rather than go into the future um i'm interested uh, as a final question is how do you choose the right partner because there's nothing like going in the wrong direction enthusiastically when you don't have the right partner steve and i have vetted each other we have the right partnership you have a partnership with richard and that has continued i know you vetted him and you asked me yeah. about him how do you choose mm -hmm. the right partner how do you okay several things um I'll refer to my buddy, John Paul Mendoza, who's been a colleague and mentor of mine for a long time. John has this thing called the three meals rule. And he says, he says, before you get into a serious engagement with anybody, you need to eat three meals with them. And if they're fake, like by the third meal, the veneer is going to be wearing thin and you're going to be able to tell. Okay, that's a really good starter. Now, interestingly, here's another Mendoza story. About 10 years ago, I went on this little vacation with him and his wife. It was just like a little two-day trip uh, through uh, Death Valley, actually. It was really beautiful. And I had never met his wife before. And so um, after the trip, he tells me, he goes, well, I asked Becky, D so Becky, what did you think of Perry? He was, he was terribly afraid that she was going to say, I don't like him, John. And every time this has ever happened, the, the guys turned out bad. Like every time his wife doesn't like the guy, like, and she's like, oh, I like Perry. He's good. And John's like, Phew. <laughs> well, I think, I think the spouse test is like super critical. And, um, you know, that's I, I got happen, it. That's going to happen to me soon, uh, probably within the next 24 hours with Steve's spouse. We'll see what happens. <laughs> But, you know, seriously, and also, okay, I think like your body and your stomach and your gut and your heart, no. Yep. Are you paying attention? Yes. Yep. Awesome. Now, for the, <laughs> I'm not sure if it's just on my end or if, if, if you guys are seeing this at home also. Um, but right now I seem to be the lone survivor on video. <laughs> so maybe I'm just seeing, maybe I'm just seeing myself here. Uh, but Alex and Perry, if you can go ahead and refresh, uh, you see us all. Okay. So then it's just me. All right. I will refresh when we go into the Q and A. All right, cool. All right. So, and that's the beauty of technology. You just never know what's going on on the other side of the world. All right. One more question here. Uh, and then we're going to actually move into the green room when we stop the podcast version here and give those who have joined us live the opportunity to ask you questions. So now is an awesome time to use the forward slash capital Q and put your question into the Q so Perry can answer your question personally. Uh, the question that I have for you is, can you talk about the, and you, and you mentioned this earlier about email. I want to get your take on, because this is something that Alex and I have been uh, discussing and, and really kind of killing the sacred cow, if you will, here whereby there seems to be an increasing value of someone who joins you as an audience participant versus the decreasing value of someone who is an email subscriber. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about, at least in your opinion, 
the value between someone who participates as an audience member, like in this case here on Blab, versus someone who is a subscriber on your email list? So if you think about what has happened to the internet, if you go back to 2000, 2003, 2005, the kinds of businesses that were thriving on the internet were businesses where the internet is actually a way to hide from people. That was what worked in like 2004, okay? And, and we, we're gonna take a business and we're gonna stick it up on a website and there's gonna be this little machine and it, di it dispenses these kind of artificial pieces of me and then people come along and pick them up. And there were a lot of people that could run a business like that for two or three years and like never have to talk to anybody. Well, the internet is, is now essentially a live 24 seven medium. Okay, and so the, the real value is in the live, um, especially, especially, um, you know, when, when somebody actually wants something that you've created. Well, it goes both ways, okay? So everybody, everybody who is listening today is on the other end of a live performance and you bring value just like I do, right? Alex and I, and you know, we're, we're all performing, but so are you, right? The audience is the other half of the performance, right? So like in, in, in marketing and sales, the highest value place you can ever get a customer just about is a live seminar where somebody bought plane tickets and they flew across the country and they paid the tuition and they showed up at the seminar. That's like just about the best quality customer you can get. Well, a, a audience participant is the virtual equivalent of that. And you can't like, you can't fake it. It's in real time. It's not asynchronous. So, so that's what's happened, right? So, uh, so that's where the value is. And, and so mm -hmm. most people's media is going to have to include a live broadcasting component. Gotcha. Alex, you want to take us home with the last question here? Well, final question is, uh, what's the first thing you have planned for tomorrow, Perry, as a, as a focus? I like rituals. Like, what's tomorrow? If we were to look over your shoulder and we're flying on the wall, what's the first thing? Okay, this is what I do every day, seven days a week. Been doing this for two and a half years. I get my notebook. I pray and journal for an hour. And that's like the first thing. Take a shower cup of hot tea and my notebook for an hour and nobody's bugging me and nothing's going on and it's six o'clock in the morning and it's like the best thing I ever did every day. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's do this, which is we're going to end the podcast version here of push button influence. We're going to give people who have joined us live the opportunity now, Perry, to ask you their questions. What we want you guys to do is join us live every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern for Push Button Influences. We bring to you the world's leading influencers who share their strategies and tactics and tools and shortcuts that can help you broadcast your brilliance. Now, it is really exciting because I'm, I mean, Alex, you know who's up next week, right? You know who we got? Yeah, we got Joe Com, who you mentioned earlier there, Perry. And right. then the week after that, we've got Ocean Robbins. And if you don't know Ocean, that's a heck of a story. And that guy is a push button influencer to the hilt. So we're going to end the podcast version here. Make sure you go to pushbuttoninfluence.com to access your free surprise gift, to access all of the push button influence episodes, including shows with Johnny Lee Dumas, 
Pat Flynn, Russell Brunson, and many, many others. All right, we're going to play some fancy exit music here, and then we're going to go into the green room to answer your questions. On behalf of my co-host extraordinaire, Alex Mandosian, I am Steve Olsher, and for Perry Marshall, we are now ending the podcast version here of Push Button Influence. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Alex. You just learned how to broadcast your brilliance. Tune in live to Blab.im, Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Pacific, as the world's leading influencers share their proven strategies for leveraging the power of new media. For more information about your hosts, Alex Mandoshian and Steve Olsher, to claim your free surprise gift and to access every episode of Push Button Influence, visit PushButtonInfluence.com. 